Our world order is undergoing big changes, and they're not necessarily for the better. Our world is becoming more dangerous. Two powers are in a race, the United States and China, and they're ramping up their weapon stockpiles. They're arming themselves with more dangerous weapons and more nuclear weapons. We are entering a new strategic era, one that will be defined by the great, this great power contest. The risk of conflict is higher than ever before. I'll show you how, and we'll start with China. The PLA is eyeing a new weapon, a drone. It will be used to snoop on rivals. The Chinese military is amassing all kinds of spying tools these days. First the balloons, then a base in the Antarctic, we told you about it yesterday, and now the drones. The Americans say they pose a threat. They ordered a secret military assessment. China's new drones will fly at supersonic speeds, they say, at least three times the speed of sound. The drones have more capabilities, including a cutting-edge surveillance system. This will relay real-time data. How can this help the PLA? Such capabilities can be the difference between victory and defeat in war. Using this data, the PLA's generals can make real-time decisions. They can order missile strikes and strike with precision. Reports say the PLA has already established a unit for this drone, the supersonic drone. It falls under their Eastern Theater Command. And where will China deploy these supersonic drones? Taiwan is a clear target. These drones can help China target American warships around Taiwan, even the military bases in the region. So drones are a clear worry. But there's a bigger threat, and that is nuclear weapons. China wants more nukes, and it wants them fast. Xi Jinping seems determined he wants to close the gap with America. So he has ordered an expansion plan. China has about 410 nuclear warheads today. By the end of this decade, this number could grow to 1,000 warheads. And by 2035, China could end up with 1,500 nukes. This will bring them close to America's stockpile. How many nuclear weapons does the U.S. have? In 2021, it had around 3,750 nuclear weapons, nuclear warheads. These include both active and inactive warheads. China wants to catch up for obvious reasons. It wants to use these nuclear weapons as deterrents to keep America away from Taiwan. And it's speeding up the production of these weapons. It is now building a new reactor in Fujian. This reactor will deliver plutonium. What's plutonium? A radioactive chemical used to make atom bombs. So China has conveyed its intentions. It has started a new nuclear race. And the U.S. plans to not be left behind. It has plans to modernize its nuclear arsenal. Washington will spend $2 trillion on this, $2 trillion on nuclear weapons. This money will not be spent in one go. The U.S. plans to spend $2 trillion over 30 years to completely upgrade their nuclear triad. What's a nuclear triad? It basically means the ability to launch nuclear strikes from land, sea, and air. That's a triad. America can do all three. And now it is upgrading these weapons. It is responding to a two-front challenge, the threat from China and the threat from Russia. Because Russia, too, rem remains a player. Russia, too, is developing new nuclear systems. In February, Moscow refused to honor the START Treaty with the U.S. The START Treaty placed limits on nukes. It came into force in the 1990s. The U.S. and Russia decided to cut back on their nukes after the fall of the Soviet Union and also allow inspections on nuclear sites. That's what they agreed to. Those were some of the key commitments. But Russia has suspended its participation. So the world is now in a three-way arms race, the U.S., China, and Russia. And this race is more dangerous than the Cold War era. There were just two major nuclear powers then. Now there are three. And this is alarming not just for these three countries, but for the rest of the world too. Because this could lead to a trickle-down effect. How would a country like India read the nuclear buildup in China? This is a threat to India too. If China can target America with nukes, it can do the same across the Himalayas. Speaking of a new strategic era, it's not just about military realignment, it's also about diplomatic changes, about old allies drifting apart and new friendships popping up, like in Latin America. After the 1950s, it was basically a CIA playground. They carried out 34 coup attempts in 12 countries, 34. But this is 2023, and things have changed. 
Latin America is a lot more confident and assertive. Let me give you some examples. Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov is currently touring Latin America. His first stop is, was Brazil. Their president, Lula da Silva, has a taste for foreign policy. He hasn't joined Western sanctions against Russia, neither has he sent weapons to Ukraine. But on Monday, he made an interesting statement. Lula blamed the US and Europe for extending the war. Listen to this. Getting peace there is very difficult. President Putin does not take the initiative to stop. Ukrainian President Zelensky does not take the initiative to stop. Europe and the United States contribute to the continuation of this war. The response was swift. Washington accused Lula of parroting Russian and Chinese propaganda. For Lula, it was a big statement to make, because Brazil is a major non-NATO ally of the US. Bilateral trade is worth over $100 billion. So Washington's criticism unsettled Lula. The very next day, he condemned the Russian invasion of Ukraine. At the same time, he reiterated his peace offer. So that's one US ally acting a bit shaky. The second is Mexico. Their president is openly accusing the Pentagon of spying. Listen to this. Then we also have to take care of our information for the sake of national security. I made this decision. No, we are now going to safeguard information from the Navy and the Defense Ministry because we are being a target of spying by the Pentagon. Quick context. The Mexican president was talking about the Pentagon leaks. They mentioned military tensions between Mexico's Navy and the U.S. Army. Whatever the reason, the outcome is bad for Washington. Mexico is their largest trading partner in the region. Total trade, more than $600 billion, not to mention the porous border between them. Now, both these examples should raise alarm bells in Washington. They threaten one of the cornerstones of U.S. policy. It's called the Monroe Doctrine. What does this policy say? that the U.S. must have total domination over the Western Hemisphere. No other power should be allowed to enter. The first target of this policy was European powers, but not anymore. The new threat is China and Russia. As always, it's the money that's making the moves. In the year 2000, China's trade with Latin America was $12 billion. Now, $430 billion. It is the region's second largest trading partner overall, and first, in countries like Argentina, Brazil, and Venezuela, China is their biggest trading partner. And don't forget the loans. China has lent $140 billion to Latin America. In exchange, they got access to oil. These numbers cannot be dismissed as random. They reflect a change in U.S. attitude. For decades, they took Latin America for granted. All the coups, all the so-called wars on drugs, all the relentless lecturing. Surely it had to backfire at some point. So naturally, Latin American nations are exploring their options. Last year, Joe Biden hosted the Summit of Americas. Leaders from Mexico, Cuba, and Venezuela did not attend. He got a second embarrassment last month. President Lula of Brazil skipped his summit for democracy. So the message to Washington seems quite clear. This isn't the 1950s anymore. But does that mean Latin America is cozying up to China or Russia? Well, not necessarily. This shift is more about neutrality than picking sides. It's about making the most of the emerging order. An example of that is Argentina. Reports say they're interested in joining the BRICS. It would mess up the acronym, but that's the rumor. Going forward, the Monroe Doctrine is likely to get weaker. America faces a similar challenge in West Asia, but there, U.S. military assistance remains unrivaled. That's not the case in Latin America. Such a shift may not happen overnight, but it's certainly in the works. Now to Taiwan. It wants people to learn English, and it's ready to spend almost a billion dollars to push for it. The government says it wants to make Taiwan bilingual, and it has set a deadline for this, the year 2030. This money, the billion dollars, will be spent over the next five years. Why do, what do people in Taiwan speak right now? Mostly Mandarin Chinese. And why does Taipei want to switch to English to boost the economy? You see, whether we like it or not, English is the global language of business. One-fifth of the world speaks it. So it makes sense to do business in a language that most people understand. Earlier, Taiwan's trade largely depended on China. So they did not really need English. But now, with tensions rising, the commerce is also being limited, and Taiwan is heavily dependent on trade. Its economy is worth $829 billion. 
and about a third of this depends on exports, high-tech hardware exports. So promoting a language that facilitates business is essential. It makes sense. Taiwan sees multiple benefits from its switch to English. It will help domestic companies do well abroad. It will attract more foreign investments and tourists. And it will make Taipei more competitive. Who are they competing with? Other Asian economic powers like Hong Kong, Singapore, the Philippines and India. All former colonies and all with a large number of English speakers. In fact, Hong Kong is trilingual. They speak English, Mandarin and Cantonese. It's a byproduct of Hong Kong's complicated legacy, but definitely a boon when it comes to business. Then we have Singapore. It got independence in the year 1965 and since then it has promoted English as its main language. Again, this was for economic purposes and the results are evident. Next on our list is the Philippines. It was colonized by the US. After independence in 1946, Manila stuck to English. And then there's India. The story is a bit more complicated here. Only about 10% of India knows English. But considering India's population, it's a pretty big number. India has the second largest English-speaking population in the world. It's a massive market that foreign firms want to tap into. Also a source of English-speaking labor. Although our relationship with English is complicated, and this could be true for all former colonies, English is both a reminder of colonial oppression and a route to upward mobility. The oppression part is obvious, but the language has allowed some, some of us to thrive economically. The go-to example in India is a list of Indian origin CEOs helming US giants, Microsoft Satya Nadella, Google Sundar Pichai, Indra Nui, Ajay Banga, Shantanu Narayan. It's a long list, and no matter how good their other skills are, which are obviously good, they wouldn't be there if they did not know how to speak English. Most people and their governments know this. Around the world, countries work on their English language proficiency to attract businesses and investment. Even countries with no history of British rule. I'll give you an example. At least 85% of the people in all Scandinavian countries speak English. Most mainland European nations have a sizable proportion of English speakers. So Taiwan's policy is not novel in any way. But their timeline, we say, is ambitious. Seven years to teach English to millions of people is unheard of. Even Singapore, with a century and a half of British rule, took decades to make most citizens English speakers. So Taiwan's goal is a tough one to achieve, especially with the dragon breathing fire and threatening war. We wish them luck. Have you ever seen a time machine in real life? If not, you could soon get the chance. Just turn on the TV on May 6th. You will be transported at least three centuries back. You will see a king ride a golden chariot. You will see him wear looted crown jewels. You will see loyal ministers line up inside a huge church. Basically, a whole lot of entitlement. Disclosure time. Time machines do not exist. What I just described could be the coronation of King Charles. It's scheduled for May 6th. Now, if you're wondering how coronations are still a thing, you're not alone. Around 51% of Britons feel the same. They say the UK government should not be funding the coronation. The question is, what is the estimated bill? And turns out there isn't one. The UK government has not revealed what the coronation will cost. Talk about insult to injury. First, you make citizens pay for a 17th century ritual. Then you don't even tell them how much it costs. And the timing could not have been worse. UK's inflation is at 10%. It is the highest in Western Europe and G7. People are struggling to pay their food and power bills. And what does the government do? Splurge on the king. I know the new currency has its face on it, but it doesn't make it any better. While the government has been silent, some independent estimates have emerged. King Charles's coronation could cost anywhere between $60 million to $120 million, and that is taxpayers' money. Money that could have been used to build schools, to hire more teachers or doctors, basically anything but putting a 74-year-old man on a throne. But that's the Great Britain for you. Now, I know a lot of people will say it's Britain's money. They can spend it any way they want, which is true. But maybe ask your own people as well. By all accounts, the coronation will be deeply unpopular. Some of the biggest British stars have refused to perform at the event. Harry Styles said no. 
Elton John said no. So did Adele, Spice Girls and Robbie Williams. And frankly, it makes sense. Perfect sense. Why would you want to associate with an institution that pioneered slavery and colonialism? And that too in 2023. This brings us to the international reaction to the coronation. A lot of world leaders have accepted the invite. Joe Biden, for one, has been invited. India's President Draupadi Murmu has also been invited. So has Pope Francis. And many of them will attend the ceremony on the 6th of May. But that's not because they love the monarchy. It's basic diplomatic courtesy. But for a moment, think of all those former British colonies, all those communities enslaved, looted and massacred in the crown's name. King Charles is the new face of that institution. And I'm not saying he's an evil person or he was directly involved, but the optics are undeniably cruel. And speaking of optics, another painfully awkward scene awaits us on the 6th of May. Britain's new monarch meeting his Indian origin first minister. You guessed it right, Rishi Sunak. Now some people will call it an example of Britain's inclusiveness, but let's be frank here. As the kids say nowadays, it will be cringe-worthy. The last coronation in Britain was around 70 years ago. Different monarch, different times. Today, we live in the era of political correctness. So why hasn't anyone cancelled the monarchy yet? Think about it on the 6th of May. As you watch King Charles ride a gilded chariot, paid for by taxpayers. As he walks out in fine clothes, paid for by taxpayers. And as he puts on the crown jewels, probably looted from a colony. I guess the British anthem makes sense now. Only God can save the king. Our next story takes me back to a poem. It's by the Soviet poet Boris Slutsky. And this is what it says. It's not even humiliating. In fact, it's rather fun watching our rhymes deflate like foam as greatness retreats solemnly into logarithms. Do you know when this was written? In 1959, he was talking about the defeat of poets at the hands of engineers. And today it seems unintentionally prophetic because robots are coming for your poems, paintings and music. In fact, they're already here. The world of art is living with artificial intelligence or AI. And this week, we heard the future of music. Let's just say it was scary good. We are talking about Heart on My Sleeve, a song made by AI. It cloned the voices of famous artists, Drake and The Weeknd. But here's the catch. There was no real way to tell that it's a fake. And it sounded like a complete hit. So obviously the song exploded. It garnered millions of views on YouTube, Spotify and other platforms and now it has been removed. Some are looking at this as a minor nuisance. Others call it harmless mimicry. But for most of us, it points to something more serious. Is AI the harbinger of headaches for the world of music? And also for art in general? Look at this photograph. It's very good. It's also very fake. This is also AI generated work. It was submitted in a photography contest recently. It won the award, but the artist declined it. He said it would be unfair to do so. I wanted to see if uh, competitions are prepared for AI images to be handed in, and uh, they are not. It's very um, important that they are aware that um, there will be more and more AI-generated images in photo competitions, and it should not be mixed up. But let alone competitions, is the world prepared for AI in art? We are currently at an inflection point. Names like ChatGPT, Bard and Midjourney come to mind. And they have come a long way. It's not just about nerdish fascination anymore. Common people like you and me are using these AI tools. They're creeping into our lives and flooding the internet. Remember when Jay-Z rabbed Shakespeare? Or when the Pope was seen wearing a Balenciaga puffer jacket? This is creative and it's good humor, but it's also scary because our fear remains the same. Can AI do a better job than the artists it is imitating? It churns out art faster and its tech is improving. Soon differences between real and AI generated art could become indistinguishable. Experts say using AI is a violation of an artist's creativity and personhood. Lazy artists may use AI. 
and it may even infringe upon livelihoods. So we will say what we've always said. Even if creativity must not be curtailed, AI needs more guardrails in place. And even if policies take their own sweet time, we can relax a little. Because art remains somewhat isolated from artificial intelligence. I find human drawings more appealing, precisely because they are messy. When you see drawings by a traditional artist, sometimes the hand is disproportionately big. But because it is disproportionate, it looks appealing. There is no risk of artists being replaced by artificial intelligence because the creative act is the most human of all acts, which comes from an intention and therefore from consciousness, which comes from something that artificial intelligences are very, very far from having at the moment. Think about it. The enjoyment of art is reliant on humanity. We don't love music because it is a digitized accumulation of chords and lyrics. We love it because it comes from a human being. It is inspired by their experiences, their ideas. Like when Rihanna's song said, nobody text me in a crisis, we felt that. Or when Taylor Swift sang about her relationships, a lot of people could relate. Because we connect with the artist. It's true that AI fakes today are merely a sideshow. There is much more to come. But AI will continue to be a sideshow in the real world of art. We say true genius will beat the algorithm every time. So we agree when, when Slutsky said, it's not even humiliating. In fact, it's rather fun. The US and Russia are dangerously close to an armed conflict. This year, 2023, New Delhi will be the capital of global diplomacy. For a country as diverse as ours, with 88% of the population illiterate, it was a very big deal to write a constitution, and that too, the world's largest. Meanwhile, if we may, there's a Republic Day gift from India for the BBC. A list of suggestions for the BBC for their upcoming documentaries. Number one, the Kohinoor and the colonial loot. Number two, an outdated monarchy and unhealthy obsession with the royals. Number three, racism in 2023. We're waiting.